another month and another eye-popping inflation number for Canadians. The cost of living rose 7.7% in May compared to the same time last year. That's a 40-year high. It won't surprise anyone who's filled up the tank or shop for groceries in the last last few months with little relief in sight. And it has money minds worried about the economy running off the rails. Is Canada headed for a recession? Hello and welcome to One Publish TV. I'm Ed Hand. The Bank of Canada has moved to curb inflation by hiking interest rates with further increases on the horizon. Fully three quarters of Canadians feel we are headed toward recession or are already there, according to recent surveys. Now, this is more than a made in Canada problem as the issues sparking it are global supply chain breakdowns, COVID lockdowns in China, the Russian invasion of Ukraine have all thrown fuel on a red hot economy. Our unpublished vote question asks, do you feel the Canadian economy is heading for a recession? Yes, no, or unsure. Almost 88% said yes, just over 6% said no, and just over 6% were unsure. However you're watching and listening to our show, whether through our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, or podcast channels, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and more, I'd like to remind you, you can still cast your vote on this topic at unpublished.vote, and then email your MP to tell them why. Joining us to discuss the potential for a global recession and the impact on Canada, Jim Stanford is the director for the Center of Future Work. Moshe Lander is a professor of economics at Concordia University. David McDonald, senior economist with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Ian Lee, associate professor with the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. And Mike Veal, professor of economics at McMaster University in Hamilton. And I thank you all for joining us. And Jim, we'll start with you. I guess the basic question is, Canada, is Canada heading for a recession? Well, Ed, in your introduction, you talked about the high inflation number, which is obviously a concern. And then you said, therefore, people think we're headed for a recession. But it isn't the inflation that's going to cause the recession. It's the reaction to the inflation that could cause the recession. Uh, You've seen in Canada and around the world, you've seen central banks kind of pull out their old uh, their old uh, hymn books, if you like, from the good old 1980s and 1990s and say, anytime uh, we've got inflation, we know one thing to do. And that's increase interest rates and increase them fast and hard. And that's happening here and around the world. And uh, it's that reaction more than the inflation itself that uh, really, I think, has spooked financial markets. We've seen uh, significant uh, downturns in uh, equity markets and especially in more risky assets like crypto or uh, emerging market debt, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if your if your poll, Ed, is any mm-hmm. indication, uh, Canadians think we're headed to a recession and sometimes that belief alone can cause the recession. It can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So. Uh, lots of worries out there, but it isn't the inflation. The inflation is a problem, but it's not the end of the world. It's the reaction to the inflation that is the bigger risk, in my view. And what what do you think, Moshe? Is that uh, your perspective on it? Yeah, it's a pretty good assessment by Jim. There, I, I would I would add to it that you know we we look at what people think about whether we're heading for a recession or not. But the the interesting thing is that most people don't know what a recession is. They they just feel that somehow it's a very uh, micro sort of analogy. If I have a job and my family and friends have a job, then I guess the economy is doing well. And if I don't have a job or my friends don't have a job, then I guess the economy is doing badly. So uh, a lot of what's driving it right now is the way that uh, the fear of a recession is being shaped through the media. It's not to say it's the media's fault. It's, uh, you know, I, I did an interview for a TV station and their lead runner was, uh, you know, aggressive interest rate hikes coming uh, and it, it's creating a certain amount of hysteria. So in, in Jim's uh, description there, psychology does matter. And if you create the fear of recession, that in itself can make it all the more likelier uh, than just saying, look, uh, rough times are ahead, but everybody stay positive uh, or there's great opportunity here, whether it's through equity markets, there's good deals out there or housing's about to come a lot more affordable or whatever it is. That That's the type of thing that can keep the economy at least humming along without meeting the technical definition of a recession. Uh, now, David, if we if we talk about you know the reaction to inflation being the being a problem, well, not doing anything can't be can't be good as well, can it? Or or is maybe that is something the Bank of Canada should look at and make it hands off? Yeah, I mean it's worth understanding what increases in interest rates rates could mean, what they meant in the 1980s and 90s when they went up rapidly. 
um, in order to combat inflation. Uh, you know, over those periods, we saw massive job loss. And so this is the flip side of this approach to inflation. I mean, if this is our only tool, increasing interest rates until the economy goes into recession, that would be an effective way to get inflation down. That's the trouble. But the trouble is it's at very high cost. Uh, and so the question is, can we get there without you know, losing hundreds of thousands of jobs in the process. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's the challenge for us. I mean, here's something that we haven't dealt with in three decades uh, is higher inflation. Um, it's coming through particular channels. We can attempt to address parts of it and we can blunt the impact for lower income households in other ways by improving benefits for index, for instance, or indexing them in many cases, like social assistance rates at the provincial level, which are not indexed, is an important way to protect Canadians at the lower end from increasing interest rates. I mean, most of the federal programs at present are indexed. And so there, there is no more kind of senior on fixed income, quote unquote, those programs are indexed. Now there's delays, we could make those faster to help protect lower income Canadians, but they are largely indexed federally at the very least. Um, and so I think it's worth understanding what the cost of this increase in interest rates would mean, um, you know, in particular sectors. I mean, we're already seeing the interest rate sectors, uh, interest rate sensitive sectors like the housing sector, see an impact of these higher interest rates with house prices moderating and decreasing in some areas. Uh, we'll likely start to see the knock on effects and things like um, home renovations, for instance, and debt being taken out in order to renovate houses. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the question is that this, the idea is that we will get a soft landing. That's the goal of the Bank of Canada is to receive a soft landing. So we take a little bit of pressure out of house prices and we bring inflation down. Uh, I mean, I question how, how likely that is. Uh, that was certainly not the experience in the 80s and 90s. I mean, very severe and rapid increases in interest rates followed by severe recessions were what was necessary. I hope that's not what's necessary this time. Uh, Ian, uh, what do you think? It, it, the reaction to the potential for inflation, is that worse than I the actual inflation itself? Well, let me step back and put some actual data on the table because I think it's important. And I'm probably the only person on this panel with Jim possibly exception uh, who lived through the 70s. I was the mortgage manager of the fourth largest Speak branch. Speak for yourself, Ian. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, maybe you're younger than I am then. Then I'm the only person who lived through it. I was there throughout the 70s. I started in 73 in banking. And I was there when the uh, central bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve and fiscal policy was very, very stimulative. And uh, inflation went from four to six to eight to 10. It eventually peaked, if my memory serves me well, at 14%. And then finally, it wasn't rapid. I have to disagree with David. They did not drive it up. It took them five years. They were slow learners at that time. And it took them four or five years to realize they had to get inflation under control. And it was only in the very, very late uh, 70s, I think it was 78 or 79, that yes, indeed, then they did start to drive it up and, and it peaked at 20%. Just a quick number for everyone's benefit. National mortgage delinquency reported by the predecessor regulatory body to the OSFI reported that the national mortgage delinquency of our country went from one half of 1%, it skyrocketed all the way to 1%. In other words, 99% of mortgage uh, homeowners, homeowners with mortgages remained current at 20% interest rates. But let me come to the present to, to put some facts on the table to get my point. You know, listening to everybody, you would think that rates were up at double digit right now as we speak. And the governor of the Bank of Canada has acknowledged this. And, and Don Drummond and, and David Dodge have pointed this out repeatedly. We are still stimulating the economy. We are below the neutral rate of interest. We are not even at the neutral rate, even let forget the mid-range or above it. I mean, you know, I look at these, and, and so my view on inflation is very, very different. I argue that we it, it has been stimulated by inflation. Inflation has been stimulated in our country and other countries by uh, uh, interest rates that are unprecedented. And when I say unprecedented, I went to the Federal Reserve because I figured they'd done research. Yes, indeed, they did, showing interest rates from the mid-1700s until the present. Interest rates in the last five years, the central bank rate has never in American history been these low, this low. So then I went to the Bank of England for the similar data and the same thing. Then I went to the Bank of Canada, although it only went back to the mid 30s, 1930s. My point being, we have never experienced in a quarter of two, a quarter of a millennium and 250 years interest rates of a quarter of one percent. And so what it did, what it did was, I think, predictable. 
it caused people to go out and borrow like crazy because you would have to be mad not to when money is free. It's, it's or almost free. In fact, some would say it was free because the real rate was negative at some point. Then people went out and borrowed gargantuan amounts of money, but drove up the price of houses. And then, of course, COVID and the supply shock interruption was very real. The impact on inflation and, of course, Russia's illegal invasion of, of Ukraine was very real as well. But let's not forget that we are number one. We are still way well below the, the neutral rate. And secondly, we have never had such low levels of interest rates in, in modern history, in modern economic history in UK, Canada, or US. Uh, Mike, in terms of the reaction to uh, inflation, do, do you see it that way that it meant like it gets psychologically, I guess it impacts the population? Oh, sure. But I think the point that Nia made is actually the same point that I was going to make. Interest rates aren't that high yet. Now, we think they're going to go a bit higher. Uh, Before this is over, I think we're going to be well into non-neutrality and they're going to be be above that. Uh, And that will probably slow growth. Uh, But we knew growth was going to slow anyway. I think the chances are that we avoid a recession. If you think of a recession as being negative growth, uh, I think the soft landing is more probable. But the trouble is we're in such a fluid situation is that it it could slide the wrong way on us. There's just an unusual amount of uncertainty. Uh, Moshe, traditionally recessions come with with rising or high unemployment, but that's not the case this time around. How how does the jobless rate have an impact on on you know the economy and, and the potential for a recession? Well, it hasn't come yet. Yeah. Um, it, it still could come, right? So the the interesting thing with the data is that it's showing that we have lower unemployment rates than we did before COVID. We have higher employment rates than we did before COVID. Yet at the same time, we keep throwing around the phrase, the great resignation. And every time that I'm being contacted by media outlets, they seem to want to talk about the labor shortages that everybody seems to be experiencing. So there's this kind of great um, uh, confusion about what's actually going on out there, right? When a recession hits, uh, what's very likely to happen, or maybe I should say if a recession hits, uh, there are going to be businesses that go to the mat. Um, I I think that one of the dangerous things that we did over the last couple of years was that all of this government stimulus allowed a bunch of zombie businesses and, and industries to survive. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that retail should have died, but it was dying. Um, Amazon was certainly taking place uh, before COVID. Uh, movie theater industry, um, even some of the tourism industry was changing in the way uh, that we're seeing now accelerate. So w- when you prompt up these industries, uh, that allows a-, a bunch of zombies to exist that need to be killed off. The recession is going to kill off that dead weight. It's going to release a bunch of labor. It's going to re- release a bunch of capital. Uh, and-, and I'm going to be the one that says that's a good thing. Uh, I- I'm going to be thrilled to see that stuff released uh, because somebody's going to come along and say, that's a deal. There, there's a bunch of good labor out there. There's a bunch of good capital out there. There's a bunch of good commercial real estate space available out there uh, that I can put to better use. And that's the thing that creates uh, the the flip side of the recession, which is the, the inevitable boom that comes behind it. And it's what leads to long-term sustainable growth. So, hey, if the unemployment comes, it, it's going to be coming from sectors that probably should have experienced it uh, without COVID and just got saved by a lot of curb payments. Uh, Ed, uh, Ed, can uh, I just jump in sure. uh, on, on Moshe's point there about the uh, very low unemployment rate, which is bang on. Unemployment's lower than it was before the, the uh, pandemic. The other thing that's lower than it was before the pandemic is the rate of wages growth. And this is another puzzle of the current situation. Uh, we have a very low official unemployment rate, uh, yet we have wages that are still growing three and a half or a little bit higher now, but that's slower than they were growing before the pandemic hit. Uh, when unemployment was was also low. And, and a key difference between this inflationary episode and what we've experienced uh, in, in Ian's early years in the 70s and the 80s uh, is uh, the absolute absence of uh, inflationary pressure coming from the labor market, even though the unemployment rate is very low. And I think that reflects the big um, structural changes in our labor market uh, over the last half century. You know, you just don't have the same sort of wage boosting institutions uh, like like unions and collective bargaining and so on, they're still here in Canada, but not as strong as they were. Uh, and what we're seeing instead, if you actually break down where the inflation is showing up in our GDP statistics, it's showing up in company profits. Uh, profit margins have widened and the profit share of GDP has never been higher in Canada. So 
This is another somewhat puzzling and very new aspect of the inflation that we're facing today. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about that. You know, we have you, you talk about the, the lack of wage growth, uh, Jim, but you know, we also have uh, businesses out there that are you know banging on the door trying to get anybody in to help them out. You, you would figure wages would be on the on the rise a bit. Supply and demand, I guess, uh, but um, uh, employers are, are quite reluctant to to, to raise wages, um, and they always look for uh, alternatives. You know, for example, the business community has been very aggressive lobbying to uh, open up the temporary foreign migrant worker program in Canada because that's a, a source of uh, extra labor at, at a relatively low cost. Um, even in sectors like retail and hospitality, which have very high recorded vacancy rates, those are the sectors where, you know, have the highest incidence of job vacancies. They are also the sectors that have the lowest wages on offer. So, you know, you, you don't really need the PhD in economics to figure out what's going on there. Those are relatively unappealing jobs and people don't want to do them. So either those businesses have to improve the offer they're making to employees uh, I would say higher wages, but also better hours and more stable uh, shifts and career and training opportunities. I think that would make a difference. Or they've got to look at replacing labor with uh, technology and machinery. There's all kinds of things in the retail and hospitality sector where uh, menial jobs could be replaced. And this is where I would endorse Moshe's uh, creative destruction uh, theory there uh, to say that would be a good thing, actually, to get rid of those jobs and put people to work in more enjoyable and productive things. David, if the issue is global in terms of a possible recession, how can a country like Canada react to avoid the impact or or is it just inevitable? Well, I mean, this is one of the things looking at inflation is the key drivers of inflation are being caused in Canada. So they're being caused someplace else. It's the high price of oil, it's supply chain issues in China and so on. And so these are some of the important drivers of what's driving CPI. Uh, you know, inflation isn't just going up in Canada. It's not a Canadian problem. It's a global problem. And so insofar as the Canadian government did X or Y or Z, it, sort of the exact same thing's happening elsewhere in the UK and the US, all across Europe. And so you know, this becomes one of the underlying issues around inflation is that it's not being caused here. And so to some degree, that's the challenge of the Bank of Canada is we can raise interest rates. But if these prices aren't being caused by things in Canada, there's only so much that they can do without causing a recession. So then people you know, need a lot less gas because they don't have a job. So they don't have to drive to work anymore. Um, I think the other thing that's worth looking at is that is that because inflation is happening everywhere, interest rate increases are also happening everywhere all at the same time. They're not only happening in Canada, they're happening in the U.S. in particular, uh, and the interest rate sensitive sectors uh, that are going to be hit here are also going to be hit in the U.S. Uh, one of our major exports to the U.S. is lumber for the construction of houses in particular as a fifth biggest export to the U.S., um, and so you could, you could easily imagine a situation where Canada continues to have uh, you know, relatively easy fiscal and monetary policy, but it doesn't matter because the Americans tighten their interest rates too quickly, uh, and we get a recession through the export channel instead of through you know the collapse of house construction in Canada. Uh, and so it's it's a much more complicated picture to be sure than uh, than just what's happening here in Canada. This is something that's happening around the world. Ian, how does government debt contribute to inflation, and, and what should Canadians be watching for? If you're referring to the national government, I've never been yeah. troubled by that. I know it's a it's a, an urban legend that uh, fiscal conservatives uh, stay up at night worrying about fiscal indebtedness. Uh, with the sovereign nation has a printing press called the central bank, it's it's simply not a, a worry. But I want to go back to something David said, and I hear it a lot today. That look, there's really nothing we can do. We're a small country, and all the inflation's coming, or most of it's coming from outside. So, you know that's just the way it is. Well, of course, that's the case. Then why would you have a central bank? Uh, we have a central bank, any country, and I don't just mean the US, which is the largest economy in the world, because there are things you can do. Because yes, I don't deny that inflation, that a lot of inflation is coming in or variables are coming in to an open economy from outside. But that doesn't mean that the government's monetary policy hands are tied, because that inflation is still impacting on us inside Canada. And we're going out and buying very expensive RVs or I'm not, I'm a poor professor, but uh, there's people going out and buying expensive automobiles. There's a six month wait for a car now. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible, the waiting periods for all kinds of products that are fairly expensive. And so the Bank of Canada, the center in, in the Canadian context, certainly can respond because it can cool down the economy. 
And interest rates, it's not a theory, interest rates cool down the economy. As I saw the rates going up in the late 80s, 70s, when I was there as a mortgage manager, the number of customers walking through the door every week was going down, down, down. By the time we got up to double digit in the 15s, I'm talking the, the, the bank rate, I had no customers. <laughs> I mean, who on earth was going to borrow at that? So central rates, interest rates do impact demand. It feeds through the system. Paul, as was just quoted, I think it was last week, saying it takes a full 18 months for it to work through a particular rate increase. And I certainly won't challenge him on that. I'm sure he's got Bank of Canada researchers' data to support that. But the point is, there is something a central bank can do, even if the inflation is coming in from outside, for all those reasons that David enumerated. I don't dispute them or disagree with them, but they can still moderate and cool down the growth in the Canadian economy. They can cool down inflation. They can engage in demand destruction and uh, have some creative destruction going on to get rid of those zombie companies that I completely agree with on Moshe on that. There's no reason to keep around zombie companies. There, that's why we have a bankruptcy act and we don't put people in debtors prison as they did in the 19th century. We release the, the, the capital, we release the expertise, the technology in those companies that can't make it. And then they get released to the marketplace and absorbed by other companies that are more dynamic at value creation. So that's not a bad thing. I mean, I, I should say that there is actually, I mean, it's not that I think the federal government or the, the Bank of Canada can do nothing. I actually think there's plenty they can do. I mean, the, the federal government sets the rules for who can get mortgages. Uh, and so it has a major impact on the price of houses in Canada, which is a major part of the CPI increase. This is absolutely under our control, not the central bank's control, but the federal government's control via OSFI's regulation of uh, mortgage underwriting rules. And so this is a way that we could take a particular segment of the market, say investors, kick them out of real estate investment by changing the rules whereby it's much less profitable for them, thereby bringing the price of houses down as a specific example. Uh, you know, people who have young children uh, and are accessing childcare will see a huge decrease in their particular CPI that will far and away overcome the changes in gas and food prices, as another example, and this child care fees is a part of the CPI index. And so for them, they'll actually see a negative CPI this year. So I don't mean to say that there's nothing we can do. I actually think there's a fair amount the federal government can do that doesn't actually involve increasing interest rates in order to attempt to control demand. I mean, we shouldn't seek out a recession. That's not to say we shouldn't have bankruptcy laws, but I don't think our goal should be to seek out actively right. a recession. Just very quickly, I don't want to monopolize, but sure. very quickly, and I'm not disputing what David's saying on the fiscal side. Of course, there's all kinds of things the governments can do on the fiscal side, but I, I'm of the view that interest rates are more influential and have a greater impact on the national economy, and especially on real estate, than any other single variable. Yes, the OSFI rules on, on GDS and TDS, the debt service ratios, are very important. But if you want to get, you want to see a real impact on housing prices in Canada, increase the mortgage rate, the central bank rate that drives up the mortgage rates by from 2% to 7% and just sit back and wait and watch the data. It will have a huge, and real estate is extraordinarily sensitive to interest rates because of two simple uh, arithmetic logics. A, large amount of money. B, financed over a very long period of time, equals C, large increase in monthly payments. So that's why interest rates are so critical uh, to real estate. And we could engineer a reduction in the outrageous overpriced real estate in Canada by getting interest rates up to more reasonable uh, levels defined by the long-term average in our country. You know, Jim, we, we, we hear calls uh, from Canadians for, for help. And, and, you know, there's been the idea of the reduction in gas taxes to ease the impact on Canadians. But would that not just encourage more use and basically, you know, not have the impact of reducing spending in the first place? Uh, I don't think reducing gas taxes would be the way to go, uh, Ed. Uh, first of all, those gas taxes are collected for a reason, uh, to pay for the roads that people drive on after they fill up. So uh, there's there's a rational connection there. Uh, secondly, you know, it, it would in a way perversely encourage people to drive more. Um, I, I do think there are things that, that could be done to ease the pain and make it in a way a more equitable uh, situation. David mentioned a really important one, which is indexing uh, social benefits, uh, especially for the provinces. Uh, there's things that the feds could do that they're considering. Things that uh, Jagmeet Singh has proposed about accelerating the indexing of um, uh, uh, some of the, the credits, the GST credit and the uh, Canada Child Benefit. 
so I think uh, on, on the fiscal side, uh, Ian is right. There's things that can be done. Um, but Ian is also right. The interest rate is going to be a very powerful sledgehammer. And the problem is when you carry a sledgehammer, everything looks like a nail. So um, uh, the, the problem is they will absolutely reduce demand and reduce inflation. But as David said, at what cost? Uh, Mike, uh, there's a, a word that's been floating around since this talk of uh, the recession and the global recession, and, and that's stagflation, going back to, as Ian refers to back in the 70s. Uh, yeah, is that something that uh, Canada and, and the global economy should be concerned about? Well, sure. Uh, I, I don't think that anybody thinks here that uh, higher interest rates alone will, will curb inflation that in, in a short period of time. I think it'll take some time. And during that time, it's possible to have really high unemployment uh, and inflation. Inflation would be falling, but it would still be pretty high. Um, I don't think we're going to get the, the stag part of the, the stagflation. I think we're going to continue to have inflation. It'll slow down. Uh, but I think uh, when I was first looking at and reading through the private sector forecasts and and these people who do this for a living, I was I formed the impression that Canada's chance of a recession uh, over the next 18 months was something like a third. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe right, maybe wrong, but that was my guess. And then what gave me pause was when I looked at some of the U.S. forecasters that I, I take seriously, and they mostly had higher numbers. They thought that I, the chances of a U.S. Uh, in, uh, recession were, were higher than that. And I was trying to kind of reconcile those two things. And I actually think that's probably about right, that we have actually at this time... A, we're, if the United States has a recession, we'll likely have one. But there is a chance that they could have one and we won't. And that's partly because of the policy side that people have been talking about, but also partly because we've got a lot of strong commodity price growth uh, that's going to help the Canadian economy relative to the United States economy. Uh, Moshe, I, I'm wondering, this is, it just happened in today, but Russia defaulting on uh, its foreign debt, is, is that going to be a contributor to a possible global recession? No, I, I don't think that's going to be the thing that tilts the the world uh, into a downward spiral, right? I, I mean, it's not good news and it's the type of thing that freaks out uh, bond markets, but I, I think that's also something that was foreseeable and understandable. And it's probably what the intention of a lot of the sanctions were in the first place on Russia. It was maybe if not to trigger a default, it was certainly to make them think about their adventurism in Ukraine. So um, I, I, I think that markets will probably shrug that off. They, they've got more local concerns to worry about. Uh, and if the bond market's going to shiver, it's going to be because of profit warnings that start coming out um, when businesses announce their, their third quarter results and say, uh, you know, that the higher interest rates are starting to affect uh, operations, right? Especially uh, the, the bigger companies. I, I would throw in here, just since I, I have the open mic for a second, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in reference to Mike's point, I, I'm, I'm missing the uh, the focus of the government on trying to boost competition. Um, you know, the, the economy is very different now than the 1970s. It, it, it's lacking a lot of that competitive element. The Competition Bureau has been defanged to the point that we almost don't talk about it. Uh, take a look at the way uh, the Shaw merger is being viewed. Mm. Um, and, you know, there, there's nothing better to keep prices under control than vicious competition. And I think maybe the way that the economy has changed towards digital online service sector is kind of impeding that competition. If the government wants to do something, it's not going to fix thing in six months. But uh, as a medium to long term strategy, uh, find a way to bring in 20 different airlines into this country and see what happens to airline prices. You can do that for the banking sector as well while you're at it. Uh, and, and that's a great help. Uh, gentlemen, I, wa I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, a terrific discussion today. Our guests on Unpublished TV, Jim Stanford, Director at the Center for Future Work. Moshe Lander is a professor of economics at Concordia University. David McDonald, senior economist at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Ian Lee, associate professor with the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. And Mike Veal, professor in economics at McMaster University in Hamilton. And I want to thank you for watching Unpublished TV. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.